Good morning to you all. It's good to see you. It, it's funny. It was, I realized 40 years ago that this happened this morning, and I thought, wow, what, what happened to life? In the early 80s, Christine and I were trying to earn enough money to get me back into grad school so I could go do a PhD and, and teach. I was working for the phone company, so we moved. I moved from the business systems division over to Yellow Pages at Mountain Bell, and I became an advertising salesperson. And uh, we, we, uh, we went out to larger businesses on an annual basis and uh, sold advertising. Well, I was away a lot. So we, to take this job, we had to move to a city that was about 50 miles away, which we did. Wouldn't you know it? Before very long, the company closed that office and said, well, you guys have a choice. You can go to Arizona or you can go to Utah. And uh, so we decided to go to Tucson. And I'd been born and raised in Idaho. I, I understand winter perfectly well. And uh, when we moved, I just couldn't part with my snow shovel. I just couldn't do it. And after one winter in Tucson, I saw very clearly that I no longer needed my snow shovel. So one, one warm summer day, we had a garage sale and put all of our stuff out that we were selling, and I put my, my snow shovel out there, and I put a sign on it that said, you never know. <laughs> and, you know, some cautious soul bought it, gave me five bucks for it. So the question before us uh, from our text today is, how do we keep our lamps lit? How do we please the master by our alertness? How do we wait for the Lord well? And what is holy patience? And those are the ideas that we're looking at in our passage today. Now, it's not just a theoretical discussion either. It's not just an academic thing. It's real life. Waiting and patience are a real thing. Uh, coming up in this fall, our own congregation will once again square our shoulders and look at the best way for us to move forward to serve our Lord Jesus in the months and the years ahead. And how do we, another way to say that is, how do we keep our lamps lit? How do we please the Lord in the time of waiting before the great day? Now, there are not a few reasons why the church today worries about its future. I've been talking about them for months. I, I talk about them every now and then, and I won't repeat that. But it's tough out there right now. And it's going to get more tough for the Christian churches as time goes on in our constantly diversifying culture, as we try to find our, our role in this society that we find ourselves in, and we ask ourselves, how do we keep our lamp lit for the Lord? And uh, we can learn something this morning valuable, I think, from the church fathers and mothers of the first three centuries of the Christian era not a, uh, I haven't really studied church history, the early fathers very much, somewhat, but I uh, found a book uh, recently by Alan Kreider named The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. Now, that title got my attention. The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. Uh, Kreider's a Mennonite church historian and a missiologist, and he poses the question, this interesting question. How could it be, how could it come to pass that a tiny messianic Jewish sect from a much despised corner of the ascendant Roman Empire, we Palestine, could in the course of 300 years from Christ to Constantine, rise to become the religion of the great empire. Wow. 
He titles, the, uh, the title of the chapter on this question in the book is called The Improbable Growth of the Church in Those Conditions. And what's more, in the early church, not just anybody could join a Christian assembly um, to protect herself from those who might betray her to the authorities in times of persecution. The church was very careful about who they admitted to membership. And you could only be admitted to the communion table after you were baptized. And you could only be baptized after a, a lengthy period of catechism and teaching and testing and showing yourself to be genuine. And if you weren't baptized in a Christian church in those early days, you had to leave the assembly before the communion was served. You could stay for the sermon, but you had to leave before the communion. And yet, the movement grew amazingly. It's estimated that by the time of Constantine's ascension as emperor, of Rome, about 300 CE. Already, 8 to 12 percent of the imperial population were Christians. Something like 5 to 6 million people. It's just hard to believe, isn't it? Somebody did the math and they said that that would take 40 percent growth in the church's population every decade for those three centuries. The improbable growth of the church. However, in all those three centuries, there were no treatises issued by the church fathers on evangelism or how to win converts or what you were supposed to do to do that. You almost had to elbow your way into the faith community <laughs> during those centuries. Of course, beginning in the late 1700s, evangelism, as we sort of have come to understand it today, emerged first with the pietist preachers, the great, great preachers who held public evangelistic rallies to invite people to faith. And uh, that's sort of where we trace back the way we view evangelism today. The great preachers of the 19th century, they could pack large public halls with their preaching. And those were events that the community waited for. And there was standing room only for the great preachers. And people came to hear the great orators of the church. And many found faith. I don't know that um, oratory is held in quite so high an esteem these days. But evangelism in this modern sense didn't really emerge in Christendom until the last couple of centuries, which is interesting, isn't it? Given the, the view of how the church grew in the first three centuries, what caused it? What did they do? How can we learn from the early church about our way forward and how to keep our own lamps lit as we move into the future? Kreider said four things caused the early Christian movement to grow, that is to say, this is how they kept their lamps lit. The first was a, a lifestyle of patience. The second was their, what he calls habitus, their habits of a calm and holy life and how attractive that was to people who lived in tumultuous times. And people just gravitated to it like a moth to a flame, the calm and holy life. Third thing he says was the consistent practice of worship, teaching, and table, something that we are deeply and permanently committed to here in our own faith community. And the last one is an interesting one, something he calls ferment. Now, of these four, I want to talk just a little bit about two of them. First, patience, and then the idea of ferment. So, 
patience. Here we get the idea of keeping our lamps lit and the attendant alertness to which that, that state of being calls us. The Christians of the first centuries after Jesus believed that patience was centrally important to the Christian life. And they believed, Kreider says, that Christians should, quote, should be patient, not controlling events, not anxious or in a hurry, and never using force to achieve their ends. And he thinks that this was at this, a central idea for Christians in those very difficult decades and centuries. It's how they kept their lamps lit. So the first thing I'm wondering as we think about this is if perhaps this quiet, confident patience, holy patience isn't still what the church really needs today. Here's a, quite a remarkable passage from 1 Timothy 1.16. You'll know this well. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy so that in me as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience as an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. Now that's a very powerful passage. And isn't it interesting that Paul talks about the patience of Jesus Christ? Have you ever thought about the patience of Jesus? Small doubt that Paul wrote this because he calls himself as a sinner a former blasphemer, he says. A persecutor. A man of violence. So yes, Paul speaks of the utmost patience that beautiful phrase of Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say that we are to emulate the patience of Jesus to those who may very well come to faith. In displaying patience, we follow the example of our Lord and we emulate him in our relationship to others. Now, it isn't the patience found in non-biblical Greek which is understood as forced acceptance. You know, shoulders down. Mm, I just can't wait till my birthday comes. It's not resignation. But it's forbearance based on God's gracious forbearance of his children. And we emulate God's gracious forbearance toward us by the gracious forbearance we display in life. Especially to other people. To be Christ-like, we must show forth the patience of Christ to others. What a beautiful way to think about those difficult times when we don't really feel very patient. Huh? So what Kreider is saying, if I'm reading him correctly, early Christians didn't grow in numbers by winning arguments. They didn't grow in numbers by public sermons. They didn't have them. But they grew by their way of life. Their patience and their habitus was so attractive to people that folks wanted some of that. And what attracted people to the Christian way in a tumultuous world in spite of the many disadvantages that it offered? 
the exclusion from society, the persecution. In spite of all the disadvantages, it was how they lived that drew people to them. Patiently, calmly, trusting in their God, keeping their lamps lit. Not very flashy, but patience and vigilance. Vigilance in the form of patience. Patience in the form of vigilance. Now, patience isn't a gift. I don't think anywhere in, in the Bible it talks about patience as a gift. It, it's not a gift. It's a virtue. And uh, yes, some people by disposition are more patient than others, and some are more impatient than others. <laughs> Nevertheless, patience is a virtue. Therefore, it is for us a discipline something that we must do, something that we must actively develop in our lives, and something that we must practice to get better at. And the, the way you begin in that is you get it in your head that this is what God wants for me now, to wait patiently in alertness until that great day, like those servants in our parable today. As uh, Kate Bowler said in her blog this week, I don't know if you ever follow Kate Bowler. She says, with God anything is possible, but God can't help us with our spelling. <laughs> spelling isn't a gift. Spelling is a skill, isn't it? You have to learn how to spell. And you have to learn how to be patient. Both as a community defined by his patience and as individuals in our relationships with others. Who's the hardest person to be patient with? Yeah. Yourself. You ever get impatient with yourself? Oh, I do. Oh, man. I'm like, what's wrong with you, Dave? A vigilant people practicing patience. Now, that, that's powerful. Isn't it? That's our aspiration. I'm not saying we're always very good at it. That's why we have to practice. But if Kreider's right, and I'm, I'm still thinking about this, and it's moving around in my brain, perhaps this explains why the first treatise on a virtue in all the church father, fathers was that of Tertullian in 204, entitled on patience. Interesting. It's a bit of a side note, but I love this quote uh, from Cyprian, 256, the Bishop of Carthage, North Africa. He said, Beloved brethren, we are philosophers not in words, but in deeds. We do not speak of great things, we live them. And, of course, here we also encounter one of the starker realities of our life in the faith, even amongst those uh, among us who are the most blessed and calm and vigilant. And I call it the you-never-know factor, the snow shovel factor. Because you never know, do you? Well, it's just around the corner. That's just in the nature of life. The unexpected is part of life. So in the tagline of our parable today, Jesus said, you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Patience and alertness. Now, as to ferment... 
we need to aspire to be a patient and alert faith community, but we also must be yeasty. The dictionary defines ferment. I'm, I'm using this as a noun here, not a verb, but the noun. Ferment is a living organism such as a yeast that causes fermentation by virtue of its enzymes. Like the, the yeast in bread that makes it rise. That invisible power of the enzymes operating or the fermenting of wine in its cask or kefir that Christine makes for us. Well, so what do we do as a faith community in light of the challenges of the world we find ourselves in today? What do we do, what do we learn by the improbable growth of the early church and its ways of life that proved so attractive to a people in a tumultuous time? Well, the idea is this, that by faithfully and patiently attending to the basics of our faith, we create that same environment where there is a fermenting presence of the Spirit that takes root in that environment. And a presence which generates rising bubbles of God's presence among us. We can't see it. But you know it's happening. And then you do begin to feel the rising bubbles among us. That's what we want. That's what we want to be. That's what we're looking for here. People talk about, oh, we want to be a New Testament church because perhaps, understandably, we crave the excitement of signs and wonders and so on. But the main feature of a New Testament church is holy patience and alertness. That's how they got through. And maybe the crucial point for us is we contemplate, well, tomorrow <laughs> or the months or the years to come is that no matter what form our church evolves into, um, you know, what style of music or how we shape the programs or all of those things that could be part of a, of a path into the future, I think that means that our lamps are lit because there's a spiritual ferment among us. A yeastiness here. Born of the Spirit's presence acting through us and in us. A bubbling presence of the spirit working in our lives I'm always amazed you look at these fizzy drinks and those little bubbles are coming up from the bottom I'm like how does that happen <laughs> that's what we want we seek to find find the ways for God to get out among us and we wish to be a yeasty church Here's a great passage from Hebrews 6. Listen to this. And we want each one of you to show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope to the very end. So that you may not become sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So we ensure that our lamps are lit by attending to the core and the basics of our habitus, our worship, our learning, the table, and holy patience. All of those rather ordinary things, but essential things. And I noticed this as I was looking back in Luke. I, I sort of got a new angle on that parable of the four soils. I'd like to say a lot about it, but just this. 
This is Luke 8, 15. Check this out. But as for, as for that in the good soil, these are the ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with <laughs> patience and endurance. That's exactly what the good soil is. Oh, I guess it was six or eight weeks ago we concluded that six-week series on uh, the creed. And uh, we did that because we wanted to get our, our minds and our hearts back to the center, to the basics of what we believe so that we would understand what's central for us, what's important, and what's peripheral. And uh, I really enjoyed that series. It was a pleasure doing it with you. And this morning we're going, to stand, we're going to stand and say the Nicene Creed together and, and we're going to use it as an affirmation of patience and alertness together to gather our senses together around what is truly important for us and let me ask you to stand and say with me the Nicene Creed. Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son while the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.